welcome to the Spent the Rent podcast. I am your host, Patty Rose. My guest today from Core Eugene is Brittany Rain. Brittany, welcome to the show. Thank you. So I wanted to have you on. We had just start, started talking about uh, this. I reached out. I had seen your guys' stuff on, on Facebook um, for CORE, which is an acronym for Community Outreach Through Radical Empowerment. And I've been seeing your posts, and I reached out, and you said, I actually have some time today. So this is kind of an impromptu episode. So first of all, CORE, which is Community Outreach Through Radical Empowerment. Why don't you tell me a little bit about CORE, what CORE does and what you're about? So I'll um, tell you kind of the history on how CORE started. I've been working in the nonprofit industrial complex for 12 years. I um, CORE was really built out of a frustration with how systems work and how frustrating they are and how a lot of times they're more aligned with what communities want versus what the people who are actually being served in them. My partner and I moved down to Eugene about three years ago and we started CORE. We um, we didn't have a name for it or anything like that. We just like went and started doing street outreach. Um, and then we started building relationships and rapport with young people and asking them what they wanted. And the things that were identified in there were youth who were between the ages of 16 and 24, 16 to 30, said that they wanted a safe place to congregate. They wanted... Um, food that wasn't pizza and donuts, and they wanted um, access to education and jobs. So then we wanted to have a really strong name. And based on like my experience in social work and doing it for so long, we um, basically core is like the community outreach through radical empowerment. So we want to engage both sides so the housed and the unhoused. And we really want to figure out how to like empower people on an individual basis to make their lives better and like really focus on their goals and not what we think is best for them. Um, and it's basically like, we don't want them to like feel like they need us. And that's really what CORE is about. And then CORE is also about really engaging the community around us to help uplift young people. Right. Does that and answer I've, your question. Yeah. And I've noticed by kind of clicking around, uh, I've seen a lot of your Facebook posts. I think we be, it came into my uh, world within the last few months. I had started seeing friends. I think we became Facebook friends and then uh, mutual friends had shared it. And there's a couple different pages, which I'm going to put both in the show notes because there's different ways to reach you and you've kind of streamlined it because core is such a long acronym. There's one page that's a business page that has kind of the more of the business end of it. And then your page that you run as the executive director is just called core Eugene. And so I'm going to put both of those in the show notes with links. And so, you know, I think for a lot of young people, core Eugene, once the name is out there that they'll, they'll know that you, they can reach out. Also, there was a big uh, revelation for you today where the phone number finally tell us a little bit about how this process you know went to be but but now it's a lot easier for people to reach you yeah so we just have been like we started street feed a year ago um and it took us a long time to get to street feed and we've just been focused on focused on working with youth and young adults and then um somebody sent us an email in the last couple of days that was like we want to make this flyer um that gives like people solutions on people to call. And like, if you're a young person, like you need a lot of different avenues to like communicate. So it's like Instagram, Facebook, email. Um, and we didn't have a phone number. And I guess it just like, we've been so busy that we didn't even realize, um, we didn't realize like, oh wait, we should probably have a phone number that youth can text and call. And it's cause we've been out there on the streets and like, the unhoused community, like they have so many different needs that are competing all the different times. So I think that like having lots of different avenue, avenues of communication is important. And on top of it, we didn't realize we could use Google voice versus like using like paying for a new phone. And we haven't had funding until recently. So we were like, oh, we can't even afford to pay for a phone service for core because we're like the scrappy grassroots nonprofit that doesn't have any funding. And so I was going to go get a paid for phone today and I was looking around and I was like, wait, Google voice is free. Why didn't we do this months ago? Right. And then, and there's also security things that it helps with, with, so you don't get inundated and you can turn it off when you're needing some time away from your job or your, you know, your side work. So 
up until now, how have you gotten the word out? I mean, obviously, like you had said, social media, but is it a lot of word of mouth where you'll have at risk, you know, youth? And so when you say, real quick, actually, this is, let me ask a first question. When you say youth, now that that's more like 16 to 30. So youth is typically described as under 18 and young adults is usually 18 to 24, 18 to 30. Our programs all have different age ranges in them based on other programs that are similar to that and what they have found is best. Um, so Street Feed is 16 to 24. Um, our SOAP, which is our Street Outreach Alliance project. We love acronyms because, you know, that's that social worker life. Sure, sure. Um, so our SOAP, which is our Street Outreach project, is 16 to 30. And then... Um, the lens program is like 16 to like 25, 24. Um, that one's just really kind of open-ended. And then the hype program, which is helping folks access education is 16 to 30. Right. So, um, so then so, go ahead. I was going to, okay. So, so when you have outreach as up till now is a lot of word of mouth and then just your website, which I'm going to have in the show notes as well, show notes as well. Has it kind of primarily been, you know, you, you help a few people and then those people say, Hey, this is how I got help. And then you find kind of new people that are needing assistance. Yeah. I think it's word of mouth and it's like flyering and it's, um, word of mouth is always going to be our best referral source. Um, because young people trust young people. Right. Um, and so if a young person has a good experience with us, they'll connect us actually in like a message chat on Facebook or they'll email us. Um, and they like are starting to build a lot of rapport and trust with us. And historically in this community, not just with youth and young adults, but with older um, unhoused populations, they don't trust service providers here. Somebody described Lane County social services as like a hammock, like a bunch of different hammocks that are spread randomly that have holes in them and are old. Um, whereas if you go to like Seattle or even Anchorage, Alaska, they have kind of a security net, like a, they have like a net with holes in it versus just like random hammocks. Um, and people seem to think that like Lane County is resource rich and we're not here. Um, there's a lot of holes in our system. And and as the TAC report really, um, when we did the TAC report, which is, um, it was through the technical assistance collaborative. And it basically was like, what were the steps we needed to take? They only focused on the older adult population. um, And like those, like what holes were in our system there. And like they were, there's huge gaps in our services here. And so Lane County, we don't, I don't think we have any kind of system that's really secure or like has like, we do a lot of like little things well here, but like there's tons of holes and gaps in our services here. Right, and I think that's why our homeless population is really difficult because again, we've, you know, prior to like us being here, like there's been a lot of folks who have over promised and under delivered. And at core, we really strive to like under promise and over deliver. And mm-hmm. what that kind of looks like is like, if we know that we have a tent in our possession, we're not going to promise that tomorrow we'll get you that tent because what if something comes up and we never want to be the people who are like constantly not following through on what we say. And so we really strive hard to do only the things that we can actually deliver on and like really, really be intentional about those things. And that has, I think, I believe that has allowed us to start to actually build some like serious rapport with our young people and even the older population, the older population is starting to trust us and know our faces a little bit. And they're starting to actually like refer young people to us, which is pretty cool to see. Cause when we first got here, some of the older population is like, well, we need help. Why aren't you guys helping us? And we're like, well, really, really passionate about youth and young adults. And like, there's a serious gap in services here. Right. So I want to talk about the street feed because that's probably one of the big things that you, one of the biggest things that you do, but let's get to that in a little bit and let's cover some of the acronyms. So let's start with SOAP. SOAP is Street Outreach Alliance Project. Tell me a little bit about that. So street outreach in Lane County, we don't do street outreach. Like it, there's not people really doing street outreach or it's not um, done very well. 
And outreach is kind of this buzz word that doesn't have a lot of meaning to it because some people will say that they're doing street outreach because they meet their clients out in the field, um, you know, or they're just like, we do services outside. That's not street outreach. Street outreach by definition is a, it's a program or a project where you are actually going out and finding people who don't typically engage in services and bringing them into services. The hard part about Lane County is again, we don't have an overabundance of services. So by not having actual places to refer people to, we have to be very creative. And the purpose of that is to build rapport with folks and then do a warm handoff um, into a resource. Now, since we don't have resources here, that are really like comprehensive, a lot of times it's gonna be up to us to do, like if somebody's like, I need an ID or I need um, a birth certificate or I really want to get this job, it's gonna be up to the outreach workers to kind of do that follow-up steps instead of referring them to a case manager. So if you have a comprehensive service, you, would, you might work with them a little bit on the surface as an outreach worker, but then you would refer them over to the case manager. Right. So there is in other places, there is like a structured organization for soap, essentially, and just not. Yeah. Anything. Or like you have options. So like when I was doing street outreach in Seattle, for example, I had an outreach team and then we like we could refer them to other parts of our agency or even like when I worked in street outreach um, settings that were just street outreach, there was so many different resources that I could actually refer somebody to an equitable place that fit well for them and here we don't we're just so limited like in youth services the only people who provide youth services in Lane County from my understanding is 15th night Hosea looking glass and core and that's it um and then 15th night is just kind of starting to do um direct what we call direct service so like directly working with clients Hosea is faith-based, so sometimes people are off-put by that um, because they've had bad experiences. And then Looking Glass is, you know, they all have different age ranges too, so it's like 12 to 21. Um, and so I think that like also like just because the service exists doesn't mean it's always a good fit for somebody. Right. So for example, like there might be a young person who doesn't like our grassroots um, low barrier setting and, and they really as a person need something very structured. And so in that event, I would probably refer them over to Hosea or maybe somebody's really into faith and like that's gonna help them persevere through life. So like I would refer them to Hosea or like maybe Looking Glass if they need more structure. Um, and that's kind of the hard part is there's not an overabundance of lots of different programs with different cultures um, to meet different needs. Because if you think about like young people, if we all think about ourselves between the ages of 16 and 25, our frontal cortex isn't developed yet. We don't make the greatest of decisions, even if we're housed. Um, right. We do some really funny things when we're that age. And then on top of it, add being homeless in there. And then it's just like a big, you know, we're really maybe not making the greatest decisions, but it's not even about making decisions that's born out of like being in crisis and doing what you got to do to survive. Right. And dealing with trauma or whatever has got you to this point where you're needing help, you know? So totally. now hype is another one. Hype is homeless youth pursuing education. You mentioned it a little bit before. So it's, I mean, it's a, it's pursuing education. You can speak on that more in depth. Yeah. So hype is for youth and young adults ages 16 to 24 or 16 to 30, my bad. Um, and it's basically, big, it's people whose education has been interrupted by trauma, trauma and poverty and like helping them access higher education. So the higher education system is daunting and it's really, can be really scary. Um, and it's about like figuring out what that youth wants and like, where they're at but if like a youth came to me and was like you know i um this is just an example from a position i've worked in before in social work that was like hype um like i had a youth come to me that one time that was like i really want to do coding and like i just need a manual to do coding and i was like cool 
we can pay for that. And then that person now is like making way more money than I'll ever make as a social worker. Um, but it's really like up to that young person, like, and then, but it's also like helping them like identify what's going to be the best fit for them. So like, if a young person comes to me and says, I want to be a nurse, I'm like, great, that's cool. And then I'll ask the follow-up questions. Like, how are you, <coughs> excuse me, how are you with like science and math? And they're like, maybe they're like, oh, I suck at science and math. Oh, well, what is it about nursing that you want to do? What is it about nursing that like you really like trying to get to the root of that and then trying to see if like they're able to learn science and math or if like maybe we should think about a different degree path. Right. Because maybe they just want to help people. You know, it's like a lot of times when with children, you'll ask them, especially girls or whatnot you'll ask, what do you want to be when you grow up? They'll say, I want to be a veterinarian. And it's like, do you, do you know what that entails? Because you might be able to do a different form of helping dogs if you love animals, for example. You know what I mean? But being yeah. a veterinarian, you might end up butchering them. <laughs> you know, like, so there's a different path that you could go that actually might be more fulfilling. Well, uh, and like if a young person is really, really set on like their career path and their goal, I am not the person to tell them not to do that. Absolutely. And so it's really for me about like, figuring out how somebody can be really informed about their options and laying all their options out in front of them and then giving them like all the information so that they can make an informed and an empowered choice to get in that um, section. And I'm glad you said that. Cause I want to reiterate what cores, you know, core values are yeah. It's about empowerment. It's in, and what do you mean by radical? So community outreach through radical empowerment. What do you mean by radical? I think it's like, different right so it's like going against the grain it's about doing things that aren't traditional um in my early days of social work I um and this is the best way I uh, have ADHD so sometimes like I can't really like say all my thoughts but I'll give you an example because I True. tend to speak in analogies so me too by the way yeah <laughs> so when I first started in social work I um had this youth that I was working with who would not stop stealing cars. And I, he was looking at going to prison for a really long time. And I had a relationship with the judge and basically I was like, Hey, can we get a deferred sentence for this youth? And we'll try to figure out what to do. Um, that would be a good deferred sentencing for him. And the judge was like, okay, well you have three days to figure that out. And so instead of telling this youth to stop stealing cars, because he was never going to stop stealing cars, I called every repo company in the Puget Sound and one person said, yes, they would give him an internship stealing cars, um, well, legally stealing cars. That's awesome. um, and so that's kind of what we mean by radical. And by the way, he's still legally stealing cars to this day and he has his own company and he's bonded and insured because he didn't have all that criminal history that was weighing on top of him um and so that's what i mean by radical like something that you wouldn't think of like and like not traditional like being like oh we'll stop doing this or stop doing that we want to utilize people's skills in a very radical way instead of like trying to get them to stop doing the things that they're doing and like turn those weaknesses into strengths. That's truly like what four is about is like, how do we work with people and alongside them and be their like cheerleaders? Um, something else that I see a lot in the nonprofit industrial complex is that people try to tokenize their clients. And I really hate it um, because I've been somebody who's been formerly homeless and tokenized. And so one of the things CORE really strives to do is we try to empower youth and young adults to own their success. Their success is not because of us. We're just providing them tools. And so a lot of times you'll see like these um, very, I don't know how to describe them, but you'll see a nonprofit be like, look at our success story and they're housed because of us. And we did this, this, and this with them. And without us, they couldn't have done these things. Right. Like the and poster we, child, essentially. Exactly. And it's, for me, it's tokenization of somebody and it's tokenization of their pain and their suffering. And it also is making it, it's making a narrative that that person cannot do something without the help of a nonprofit. And I don't believe in that. Um, yeah. 
I believe that as social workers, we are here to like provide people with life skills and tools and to fill in the gaps in people's lives. Um, but doing that by empowering them and then also having them own their success, you know? And so that's like something that CORE really strives to do with our young people is like when a young person gets a job or maybe they stop using or, um, we also really operate from a trauma-informed care and a harm reduction standpoint. So when a young person is quote unquote successful or meets one of their goals, a lot of times, because it's a natural human reaction, like, they'll be, thank you, Brittany, so much. You helped me so much. And I'm like, you did all this work. I didn't do any of this. Right. You did it. All I did was like, give you your options and like lay out some tools for you. Right. And so that's how we kind of go about working with young people. You mentioned the nonprofit industrial complex twice. I want to get more. I've never heard that expression. So tell me about what you mean by that. So the nonprofit industrial complex is a way to describe the nonprofit system. So the nonprofit system is very bureaucratic. Um, it's, it's kind of run like a corporation. And like historically, um, I'm also going to plug this book that I love. It's called The Revolution Will Not Be Funded. And I believe it's by Insight, which is a radical feminist. Um, I'm a little bit not well-versed. I feel like I'm not giving them as many credit as they can, but The Revolution Will Not Be Funded is a very powerful book about the nonprofit industrial complex. And it talks a lot about how these very big agencies that get a ton of like money and stuff like that, they just kind of run my partner calls it um, conveyor belt social services. So instead of treating people like an individual, we kind of have these cookie cutter services that don't actually like, that aren't actual, um, that aren't equitable to working with people. And it's just like, we're just spinning our wheels and we're, you know, conveyor belt. Like everybody has the same, like if I'm working with people, it'd be, I would be working with everybody the same way versus like, thinking to myself critically like oh well this person needs this level of support and this person needs this levels of support and this is how I'm going to go about working with this person right and, and so it's just radical. it's a way it's a way to describe how kind of screwed up the it's it's a term it's a blanket term to talk about how part of the reason we are failing people in self, social services is because we're treating everybody the same right and we're not actually approaching people as individuals. And then when a system gets so big, they start making statements like, we're gonna end youth homelessness or we're gonna end hunger or we're gonna do this. And like, I think like there's a big difference between like maybe like coalitions that are actually doing that work versus like direct service providers. So when you make those statements, you're saying that your agency solely is going to end these things. And like, it's not that simple. No, the, the nonprofit industrial complex is, you know, it's like nonprofit agencies that are serving like youth, young adults, older adults, developmental disabilities. And it's just a big hairball system. And a lot of times we're having to like, when you're referring clients to things, like when I work with a young person, like they're having to like, intersect with like DHS for public benefits and maybe the education system and financial aid and maybe even the housing system and all those systems have different ways of doing things and it can be really frustrating because a lot of times they're not treated as individuals in those systems right they're treated as just another piece in the system when people get lost in the shuffle you know I know this is a different kind of work but I had a good friend of mine who is a was a care provider so he was working with the elderly and he had a patient, this is probably against the law for me to talk about, but he had a, cause it's patient confidentiality, but he never told me the names, you know, but he had a patient that wouldn't shower and it was in home. And so he was like, Hey, tomorrow, do you want to go swimming? And his patient didn't speak, you know, was, and so he brought swim trunks, got in the bathtub, got this person to shower and she stayed mostly clothed, but he bathed her basically. And that was his job <laughs> was to bathe her. Right. So it was incredible and effective, right? Now there's laws against this kind of thing. They looked at it like it was, be he and my friend who does this job has Asperger's himself. So he had no idea why this would be. He's like, what do you mean? I think I should get awards for this. She hadn't showered in four weeks. 
literally like she would not let people and so he did this and he got fired <laughs> you know and it's like this is an issue with some of the structures now they serve their place and i'm sure you would agree that these there's this the complex like the industrial complex like you say i think it serves its purpose but it misses people and so that's what you're about yeah. so anyway so core eugene i'm gonna put uh, all of the links in the show notes, you know, with your different Facebook pages, your website. Uh, there's one thing that we needed to talk about too, before we get out of here. And it's a space that you are lacking a space. Now there's been a different effects because of COVID. I, Oh, Oh, before we get to that, the street feed, the street feed is the most, probably the most important thing you do on the daily or, or weekly or whatnot. Tell us about the street feed. It's where you feed, you know, Go ahead and you tell us about it. Yeah. So street feed is street feed is really dear to my heart. Again, like we have replicated a lot of programs that have already existed in other States um, and made them very Eugene. Right. So we made them relevant to Eugene. Um, and street feed was created because we had youth who were like, we need food and we need like not pizza and donuts, but we need food. That's like, actual like home cooked food and we need a space and after we were told that it took me a year to find a space i asked churches i asked businesses i asked other nonprofits in the community and everyone told me no um and that was pretty devastating i was really close to giving up and then somebody referred me to spectrum which is the lgbtq plus bar downtown and they are the only ones to date who have ever told me, yes, you can serve. So we've been doing street feed since June of 2019. And then COVID hit and all the restrictions happened. And so then we had to figure out essentially what we're doing right now is we increased our street feed efforts from once a month to, to every single week. And we combined our soap outreach efforts and our street feed efforts. And the way that it looks right now is that we we say we target youth and young adults on street outreach ages 16 to 30. And the way that it kind of looks different is that if we go out to a camp of like 20 people and everyone is older than our age range, except for one young person, we will go out to that camp and feed everybody in that camp because we want to reach the young person. Wow. Yeah. Um, and we're giving out survival supplies and we do harm reduction supplies, which is needles and Narcan. Um, and we're really about like giving people like access to things, like regardless of what they're doing. Um, and so the hard part though, is, is that the last few weeks, so we've, I think we're at 11 weeks or 12 weeks straight of doing street feed and that's cooking hot food and bringing it out, which is challenging. And then also survival supplies. And we're not, we don't get paid for our work at core. Eventually we will. Um, but it's, you know, it's grant writing and, we work full time in addition to core. Um, so we we basically like make local and nutritious food that is like we like support farms. Farms usually donate to us um, in the Willamette Valley. So we're like serving local food with or we're sourcing local ingredients to make healthy and nutritious food. And like I always tell people this, like our youth love it when we have like vegetable heavy meals. And you wouldn't think that teenagers or young adults want to eat vegetables, but because so many times in this community, people just give um, unhoused populations like lots of carbs and stuff like that. They just get tired of it. Sure. And like, I remember being homeless and being like, are we going to eat pasta again? Please yeah. no. Yeah. And that's, so that's the cool thing. We do lots of different stuff. So we've done tacos, we've done um, like macaroni and cheese and like uh, pulled pork sliders we've done, we've just done so many that I can't, I kind of forget how many different things we've done. We've done gumbo. I believe we we did a chili cook off one time. Um, we just try to get really creative on what we're serving people. Last weekend we did like a really heavy vegetable fried rice and shout out to winter green farm because they provided us all the vegetables um, they donated like market bucks for us. And we spent like $40 in like fresh produce at, with oh. them. Um, and then we did, uh, I can't remember some kind of pork with it and then apples and cookies and people love like 
get it like it's so great to see people's faces to be like wow like this is we hear all the time like I can't remember the last time I had a homemade meal and that breaks my heart because like food insecurity is real with like unhoused people and so that's the hard part right now is that Spectrum's not going to be open until September or October um even though we're in phase two in Lane County because they want to really be sure and like protect their staff and make sure they have all the appropriate like guidelines in place but like our youth who we're we're serving out there are like I can't wait to go back inside and just be able to chill and eat a meal because it's when you're able to like eat inside and have some kind of normalcy and you're surrounded by adults that care about you that's a huge difference than like being like here's some plate of food and you're still going to be out in the rain right so how can people help out? So your website, your Facebook, all that stuff is a, is a good place for people to reach, reach you. But how can people help out? I mean, is there a place to donate? Is there a place to volunteer, to reach out, to volunteer to you individually? or? So we vet our volunteers um, highly. And that's like where we keep the quality of our program because we sure. want to make sure CORE is a good fit for the person volunteering and us. And volunteering with us isn't glorious. Um, It's a lot of cleaning. It's a lot of really being patient and playing the long game with people. Um, You have to kind of be willing to sit with people and be really uncomfortable, um, especially if they're angry or they're pissed and like knowing how to operate through that lens of trauma-informed care. You also have to pass a DHS background check. Um, which has pretty stringent guidelines and that's for us to make sure that we're having safe people around our young people. Absolutely. Um, and so we really make sure that people are good fits for this. Um, so people who are trying to like save people are not going to be a good fit for our agency because again, we're not going to save anybody. Like really like that's in the individual. And like, if we didn't believe that we wouldn't believe they're capable of like getting to a point in their lives that they want to be in. Right. And that's, um, what, that's what empowerment's all about. Is, exactly. It's about maybe providing somebody the tools or pointing them into the direction that they can utilize the tools that you have or that, you know, you can point them towards. Totally. So like volunteers, like if you're, I will sit down and have a conversation with anybody. I'm an ED and I'm super busy all the time. But the nice thing about CORE is we really focus on quality and not, quantity um and so that's really like what another like core value that we have um and so anybody in the community i will always sit down and have a cup of coffee with you and like talk with you right and like um the other thing is so we get most people choose to donate on venmo and we're core hyphen eugene i believe i think it's, that's probably what on, our, your, it's on your website yeah right? it's, it's okay. on the website and then Some people, um, you know, they'll meet up with us or we'll, we don't, we have a weird, um, we have our physical address is like, we don't advertise it, but if it's somebody don't like donating money, we'll send them, but we don't put our physical address out there because that's where we live. Um, right. And so we're like, eh, we can't, um, advertise that for everybody. This is how it starts, you know? And yeah. So right now, uh, you know, I really encourage anybody listening to this, go to the website, go to the Facebook page, find out more. I think that the interview is cool. It's good to get to know you, but we're not going to be able to do justice for all of what you can show on your social media because people can scroll down and they can see all the work you've done. That's what drew me to want to interview you is that I I, all the work that you've done, all the people that have given testimonials as uh, volunteers that are, you know, maybe former uh, clients, if that's what you would call them, you know, so it's, it's cool what you're doing. And so I, I'm happy to know more about it. And then when, when COVID passes and we can have you in the studio, I'd like to have you and the other executive director come on and talk more at length about this and see where you're at in a little bit. Yeah. And like our biggest thing is like, we need space. Like, so if there's any kind of business, like that would be willing to like, let us, um, serve street feed in their business and like be able to serve youth and young adults again exclusively like we have a lot of uh, spectrum will co-sign for us about how great of tenants kind of if you would call us that um 
one of the coolest things that Spectrum continually tells us is that we leave the space cleaner and when we got it. So a lot of times there'll be like glitter or like whatever else because they're running lots of different programs in Spectrum. And one of the things they tell us is that like they appreciate how much we like deep clean. And so we'll, we, that's the other thing we do is we deep clean the space after we're done because um, we don't want to make a mess for anybody else. Right. And, and then any really kind cool. of, the, the <clears throat> other cool thing is, is that if folks donate space, it's actually tax deductible because we are um, under a 501c3 umbrella. And so we can write a tax deductible donation for space um, and transfer that. I think we were able to do that for Spectrum and you know, we just use their normal rate on what they charge for space. And then we were able to do that tax deductible for them. Cool. And we do have a small fund to, fund to pay for space as well. I'm going to go ahead and post this on the five for one community group as well. <clears throat> and we'll get this, you know, out and about. So uh, I appreciate you, Brittany, for doing this. Uh, Core Eugene, again, links are going to be in the show notes. All the information you, you would need for more in depth is there. Thank you for talking to me today. And I, I look forward to seeing, you know, this uh, nonprofit grow. So Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. You're very welcome. To this side, if there's a sense of concern and anxiety, it means that the government understands they have a responsibility to protect their people. And, uh, and we want to help them. The dangers of expression can prove to be social suicide. The nature of existence silent is my anxieties internalized. We hide inside a hardened core, wanting more. We hide inside a hardened core, wanting more. What's in store? Agony or destiny? I hope that you can take the best of me. I suggest that we work to reverse our cursed catastrophes. Elaborately overshooting a dignity meaning we have found and maintained integrity. Relentlessly searching, urging all to practice unity. Under scrutiny, our culture will soon perish unless we face the things we try to replace and find our sacred inner place. Erase the waste of space we walked blinded to create and make our focus to include and not alienate. of expression can prove to be social suicide the nature of existence silent is my anxieties internalized we hide inside a hardened core wanting more we hide inside a hardened core wanting more of expression can prove to be social suicide the nature of existence silent is my anxieties internalized we hide inside a heart